Well, I'm really pleased to be here and I'm really pleased to see all of you here. I want to start off by telling you a little bit about the Boston uh, Women's Heritage Trail. That's the organization that I represent. Our founding myth is, or story, is that uh, a Boston public school teacher was taking a group of children on a walking tour of Boston. And at the end of the tour, one little girl said, but where are the women? Because she recognized that there were lots of statues and plaques about the history of men in the city, but very few, if any, about women. So a group of teachers and librarians and other women got together 30 years ago and decided to do something to bring the story of women in the, in the history of Boston back to people's consciousness. We now have seven major walking trails. We have um, two in the Back Bay, for instance, one downtown, one in Beacon Hill, one in Chinatown, one in the South End, one in the North End. I don't remember if that's seven or not. And then we do some other specialty tours occasionally. We did one on colonial women in Boston. Um, we're doing, developing one now on the West End that's going to include uh, the Jewish women in Boston. We did a Roxbury tour for uh, um, African American women in Boston. And because 2020 is the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote, we're doing a suffrage trail. And we started out as a walking tour. That's what the map that Denise showed you represents. But then we turned it into a slideshow so we can sit in comfort and do the tour <laughs> instead of walking around. So that's what we're doing tonight. So um, we, as I said, we, writ we wrote and published the um, Road to the Vote. Um, it goes through Boston, tells the story of the women that were active in the suffrage movement and some of the sites where things happened. But before we get into the tour, I want to share with you one of our favorite quotes. And we can change the slide. Oh, this is the slide of the brochure. And then we can go to the quote, the next slide. This is from Sarah Orne Jewett. Nothing you ever read about them can make you know them until you go there. Never mind people who tell you there's nothing to be seen in the place where people live to interest you. You always find something of what made them the souls they were, and at any rate, you see their sky and earth. So this is what we try to remember as we walk around or as we sit here and do our trail. So we're going to start by setting the stage for the passage of the 19th Amendment. It was actually first introduced in 1887, um, but it was not passed by Congress until June 4th, 1919. As you can see, it's pretty short. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. But after passage by Congress, amendments must be submitted to the states for ratification. On June 25, 1919, Massachusetts was the eighth state to ratify the amendment. On August 19, 1920, with a yes vote from Tennessee, the required 36 states had ratified the agreement. And it was certified on August 26, 1920, and we now celebrate August 26, as Women's Equality Day. There is some discussion. Nobody's ever proved um, totally, yeah, just go back, thank you, um, what the colors and the flag stand for. This was the suffrage flag that you see down in the corner. And there are a couple of different um, theories about what the colors were. But the one I'm going to use tonight is the gold is for give, the white is for women, and the violet is for vote, so it's give women the vote. Now you can go to the next slide. And this is the front page of the Boston Globe after uh, Tennessee ratified the amendment. But how did we get to ratification? And how long did it take? It was a very long, hard road. You could actually say it started when Abigail Adams um, and her famous speech, and we've probably all heard this one. I long to hear that you have declared an independency. And by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, 
I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention are not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. But actually, it's interesting because Abigail Adams didn't actually ask for the vote. That would have been really radical. She didn't go that far. She just asked her husband to remember the ladies. That was 1776. But many people identify the beginning of the women's struggle for suffrage with the um, convention in Seneca Falls, New York. Today, this is the site of the National Women's Right Historical Park. But about 300 men and women attended this convention. They made many demands and they published something called the Declaration of Sentiments, in which instead of writing, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, they wrote all men and women are created equal. The most controversial part of the Declaration of Sentiments and the only one which did not pass unanimously was Resolved that it is the duty of the women of this country to secure to themselves their sacred right to the elective franchise. And now you see two of the famous, or two of the most famous organizers of the convention, Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. You can go next. Some identify the start of the movement for suffrage for women was the first national rights uh, women's Rights Convention, which took place in 1850 in Worcester, Massachusetts, right nearby. Mm -hmm. And uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton attended along with Susan um, B. Anthony, Sojourner Truth, Lucy Stone, and Abby Kelly Foster and others. 1,000 women and men attended this collection, convention. But if we use 1848 date in Seneca Falls, we can say it took 72 years to get women the right to vote from the beginning of the movement. Yes? Where was this convention? Is a, where was it held in Worcester? You know, that's a good question. I should look that up because I want to say Mechanics Hall, but I think I say Mechanics Hall because that's the current place. So I'm not sure that that's where it was. Well, that, I'm trying to think of the date that that was built. That was one of the only large, large enough places to handle those numbers. That's I thought. Right. I thought unless, unless it was a, a church, it could have been. I, I think it was a cabinet. Pardon me? Under they do the conference reenactment in Worcester about 20 years ago. Yes, they did. Yes, and there's a very active actually uh, women's movement there. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
When she moved to Boston, she and her husband both worked and lived for a time at Denison House, which was a settlement house on Tyler Street. In 1903, she was one of the principal founders of the National Women's Trade Union League. She was a strong supporter of women's suffrage, and she wrote a circular, which is distributed by the National American Women's Suffrage Association, called Why Working Women Need the Right to Vote. She argued that if women had the right to vote, they would get equal pay for equal work. Sarah Parker Ramon was primarily known as an abolitionist lecturer. She also campaigned for women's suffrage. She was born in Salem, Massachusetts, to a family con committed to abolition. She was thrown out of the Howard, Howard Athenaeum after refusing to sit in segregated seating, and she later brought a successful suit against the theater. After the Civil War, she campaigned for the vote on behalf of women and African Americans. Eventually, she was got tired of life in the United States. She moved to Florence, Italy. She attended medical school and she worked as a doctor in Florence for 20 years and she's buried in Italy. We'll talk about the other two women in the mural, Lucy Stone and Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin a little bit later. Nearby is Nurses Hall where there's a sculpture honoring Civil War nurses and a brass plaque honoring Clara Barton. Clara Barton was a pioneering nurse during the Civil War when she became known as the Angel of the Battlefield. After the war, she founded and ran the Office of Missing Soldiers and in 1881 established the American Red Cross. She was a strong supporter of the women's suffrage movement, perhaps because of experiences in her early life, including an instance when she resigned from a teaching job when the school hired a man at twice her salary. Another instance of unfair treatment occurred when she worked for the U.S. Patent Office. After initially earning the same salary as the men in the office, her position and pay were, late, were reduced because her boss did not believe women should work for government. Then we leave the State House, we walk down the edge of the common, and we come to the site of the offices of the Woman's Journal at 3 Park Street. It was a, the Woman's Journal was a weekly newspaper of the American Woman Suffrage Association. It was founded in 1870 by Louis, Lucy Stone and her husband Henry Blackwell. They chose office space as close to the seat of the power, the Massachusetts State House, as it could. The Woman's Journal was the most widely distributed and influential suffrage paper. By 1915, it had 27,000 subscribers in 48 states and 39 countries, and it did not miss an issue in nearly five decades. In 1879, Lucy Stone petitioned the legis well, actually, she petitioned the legislature annually for women's suffrage. But in 1879, she testified, in this very state house, how often have women looked down from the gallery while our lawmakers voted down our rights and heard them say, half an hour is time enough to waste on it, and then turned eagerly to consider such a question as what shall be the size of a barrel of cranberries, taking plenty of time to consider that. And you see Florence Luscombe, who we mentioned earlier, selling the Woman's Journal on the street in Boston. Interesting, I'm sorry, yeah. interesting list of occasional contributors, yeah. including Louisa May Alcott. Yeah. yeah. Well, we talk a little bit, I'll mention Louisa May Alcott later because she was an important suffragist. Do you know if you can go anywhere and see any, any print of that? It's on, the Woman's Journal, Journal is online. Um, okay. So I'm not sure the entire run is, but it may be, but it went on for a long time. The Schlesinger Library has it online, and also um, I think it's the University of Tennessee, maybe Women's Studies Project has okay. some issues online, so yeah. Well, thank you. Then we walk across Tremont Street to the Music Hall Orpheum Theater at Hamilton Place. Um, this is where suffrage bazaars were held. The suffrage movement, like any movement, needed money, and one of the ways they raised money was to um, hold bazaars. 
At least two were held in Boston, one in 1870 and one in 1871. The 1871 Bazaar was held from December 11th to the 21st at the Music Hall, which is now the Orpheum Theater. Julia Ward Howe was president of the Women's Suffrage Bazaar Association. That was lasted for 10 days, featured three days of entertainment, and then they sold items, including clothing, books, stationery, and confections. Suffrage organizations from other towns in Massachusetts had tables and uh, with information brochures. They raised between eight and nine thousand dollars. Then we continue to down Tremont Street to 100 Tremont Street, which um, where Horticultural Hall was. The building was demolished in 1901. But this is where the Massachusetts Women's Suffrage Association was formed by Lucy Stone, Henry Blackwell, Julia Ward Howe, Mary Rice Livermore, and others at a meeting on January 28, 1870. This organization was active in educational efforts, presenting petitions to the state legislature, organizing lectures, and courting efforts with other states' activities. Mary Rice Livermore was a prolific writer and a lifelong suffragist and abolitionist activist. She was Boston born and, and educated. She volunteered with the United States Sanitary Commission during the Civil War. She was a journalist and after the war she founded The Agitator, which was a suffragist newspaper in Chicago. Then she moved to Boston and The Agitator merged with a woman's journal and she became an associate editor of the Women's Journal. She was a tireless lecturer on behalf of suffrage and temperance, who for many years traveled extensively, sometimes speaking as many as five times a week for five months in a row. She also served as president of the American Women's Suffrage Association. Then we go down School Street and we come to the old city hall, Boston Old City Hall. In the 1870s, the school committee met in the council chambers in the old city hall building. Women were elected to the school committee before they could vote. In 1875, after a drive by the New England Women's Club, six women took their seats on the committee, all elected by men. In 1876, four women were re-elected. And, but in 1879, women won the right to vote for school committee members. Nine years before that, one of the first attempts in the nation um, by women to vote took place in Hyde Park, which was then a separate town, but it's now part of the city of Boston. Sarah Grimke and her sister Angelina were both well-known abolitionists. They were part of a group of some 50 women who cast ballots in the town election. Their votes were accepted, but were not counted. This attempt was widely covered in the press, even made the New York City newspapers. In 1838, Sarah Grimke had published a book called Letters on the Equality of the Sexes and the Condition of Women, a book that influenced Lucy Stone. In 1838, when Angelina Grimke spoke in the Massachusetts State House urging the abolition of slavery, she was the first woman to address a state legislature. And we're going to move up to contemporary times with the next slide because we're very excited to announce that in October, a bridge that was recently built, rebuilt in Hyde Park was renamed in honor of the Grimke sisters. One of the efforts of the um, Boston Women's Heritage Trail is to get more name recognition for women in Boston. For instance, there are 125 public schools in Boston, 10 of them are named for women. So we'd like to get the figures up a little bit. So this bridge was uh, just rebuilt and then it was named in, favor of the, in honor of the Grimke sisters. The plaque reads, I know nothing of man's rights or woman's right. Human rights are all that I recognize. Dedicated to the memory of Sister Sarah and Angelina Grimke, Hyde Park residents who fought tirelessly for the equality of all people in the abolitionist and women's rights movements. Then we go to Faneuil Hall. Faneuil Hall, we see a bust of Lucy Stone, 
we can go to the next slide. Um, this was a site of the women, New England Women's Tea Party in 1873. Taxation without representation is tyranny, was a clarion call at Faneuil Hall on December 15, 1873. Led by Lucy Stone, the New England Women's Tea Party was organized to mark the 100th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party. Speaker after speaker rose to address the standing room only crowd calling for equality for women, especially the right to vote, and reminding the attendees of the 1773 cry, no taxation without representation. Um, we walk back across City Hall Plaza to the Pemberton Courthouse. It's now called the John Adams Courthouse. But here we honor Jenny Leutman Barron. Jenny Leutman Barron was born in Boston to Jewish immigrant parents. She became the first full-time woman judge in Massachusetts in 1954, serving in both the municipal Boston, Boston Municipal Court and the Superior Court. As an undergraduate at Boston University, she was president of the Boston University College Equal Suffrage Association and was a street corner speaker for suffrage. She explained, I spoke from soapboxes at corners of streets and from open automobiles, at times dodging such missiles as stale eggs and overripe tomatoes hurled by alcoholic listeners. <laughs> <laughs> after 1920, after the passage of the 19th Amendment, Barron worked in favor of women serving on juries, advocated for fair marriage and divorce laws, and in 19th 26 was elected to the Boston School Committee. Then we move to Charles Street in Beacon Hill where we talk about Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin. I mentioned her before. She's one of the six women on the bond relief in the State House. She was an activist for suffrage and equal rights as well as a publisher, journalist, and editor. In 1894, she organized a Women's Era Club, a group focused on African-American women's issues, and later founded the Women's Era, the first newspaper published by and for African-American women. This is also available online, the Women's Era. A charter member of the NAACP, she was also co-founder of the League of Women for Community Service and with Lucy Stone and Julie Ward Howe, a co-founder of the Massachusetts Women's Suffrage Association. Then we go to Lewisburg Square, to one of the homes of Louisa May Alcott. Um, we know her, of course, um, author of Little Women. She was also an active abolitionist and suffragist. When Massachusetts passed a law in 1879, allowing women to vote for school committee members, Alcott was not only the first woman to register in Concord, Massachusetts, but also worked to encourage other women to vote. Across the street at Phillips is the Phillips School, where we honor Mary Eliza Mahoney. She was the first African-American woman to become a registered nurse. She was a strong supporter of women's suffrage. In 1920, at age 76, she was one of the first women in Boston to register to vote after ratification of the 19th Amendment. She was born in Boston and attended the Phillips School from grades one through four. She graduated from the New England Hospital for Women and Children and had a successful career as a private nurse. She founded the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses and she's honored by a medal awarded even to this day by the American Nurses Association. Then we walk over to the Julia Ward Howe home at 241 Beacon Street. We know Julia Ward Howe primarily for writing lyrics to the Battle Hymn of the Republic, but she did almost everything you can imagine. She was an outspoken suffragist. She was president of both the Massachusetts and New England Women's Suffrage Associations. She was an editor of the Women's Journal. She was a co-leader with Lucy Stone and the American Women's Suffrage Association. She was president of the New England Women's Club as well as a pacifist. She issued a Mother's Day Proclamation in 1870 proposing Mother's Day for Peace. 
She wrote essays, plays, books, and poetry. She founded a literary magazine. She's an advocate for women's education. And in 1908, she was the first woman elected to the American Academy of Arts and Letters. And this is something we're very proud of. This is the Women's Memorial on Commonwealth Avenue. Um, if you've been to Boston, you're familiar with Commonwealth Avenue and you know that every intersection there's a statue and there was one intersection left and uh, we managed to get all the statues were of men. We managed to get a woman's memorial on that one left remaining intersection and there was a committee formed. They couldn't pick one woman so they picked three and they have honoring Abigail Adams, Phyllis Wheatley and Lucy Stone. You've heard a lot about Lucy Stone. Um, she was a leader of the New England suffrage movement, born not very far from here. With her husband, she was the founder of the suffrage newspaper, The Women's Journal. She was one of the first Massachusetts women to graduate from college when she graduated from Oberlin in 1847. She was an active abolitionist speaker. When she married Henry Blackwell, she became the first married woman to officially keep her family name. She, and leading to the coining of the 19th century term Lucy Stoner to, meet a, to mean a woman who stood up for her rights, especially one who uses her family name after marriage. So if any of you are married women who use your family, your maiden name, you are a Lucy Stoner. <laughs> she helped organize the first National Women's Rights Convention in Worcester in 1850. She founded the American Women's Suffrage Association. She was called the morning star of the women's rights movement. She was also, interesting enough, she was the first person cremated in New England. That cremation took at place at Forest Hill Cemetery in Boston, and there's a chapel named in her honor at that cemetery. The sculpture also honors um, Abigail Adams and Phyllis Wheatley. And Phyllis Wheatley was the first African-American poet published in, critic, in uh, book form and widely recognized as the mother of African-American literature. And now we go again back to contemporary times. I think I mentioned to some of you before that in Central Park in New York, there are three statues of women, but they're not real women. They're all um, mythical women. One is Shakespeare's Juliet, one is Mother Goose, and one is Alice in Wonderland. So they finally decided to uh, make a statue of real women in uh, Central Park. And we're very pleased because the sculptor who did the Boston Women's Memorial, her name is Meredith Bergman, she was also commissioned to do the statue in uh, Central Park in New York. I think they hope to uh, have it in place by this August. The other thing we need to talk about is the anti-suffrage movement. Massachusetts, even though we're proud of our role in the suffrage movement, also was the first state to have an anti-suffrage association, and in fact had one of the largest anti-suffrage movements in the country. It's called the Massachusetts Association Opposed to the Further Extension of Suffrage to Women. And they were in this building in Boylston Street, and they shared the space with the Men's Anti-Suffrage Committee. By 1915, they had 37,000 members. Some women were opposed to suffrage because they believed it would diminish the traditional role of women as homemakers. They also argued that many successful reforms had been led by women without needing the right to vote, that women's work for the good of the public should remain nonpartisan, and that because women were so busy with home and children, they would not have time to vote. Then we go down the street in Boylston Street. We come to Chauncey Hall. In 1913, there was an article in the Boston American newspaper that said it was a busy beehive full of workers for women. Um, you can see in the next slide, one of the close-ups of one of the women that says Massachusetts Women's Suffrage Association. They shared the building with several other organizations, including the Boston Equal Suffrage Association for Good Government. That was founded by Maud Wood Park, Pauline Agassiz Shaw, and others in 1901. 
By this time, some of the women and men that were working for suffrage were getting a little anxious that nothing had happened, and they sort of, they decided to get a little bit more activist. They had been doing just lectures and conventions, and now they decided it was time to do some more things to reach out to immigrant and working women and others. And they started doing trolley tours, outdoor meetings, door-to-door -door visits, and reaching out more. They also ran a Sunflower Cafe, which is the next slide. This is um, near where Boston City Hall is now located. You can see the menu, minced lamb on toast. <laughs> um, and on the back of it, they explained why they were um, doing this. You can pay the rent of our headquarters. Um, they give a delicious lunch at a low price and attractive surroundings. In 1920, after the amendment was passed, this organization became the Boston League of Women Voters. Maud Wood Park, who served as executive secretary of this organization, was a dedicated lecturer, lobbyist, and political strategist for suffrage and a co-founder of the College Equal Suffrage League. She worked with the National American Women's Suffrage Association, and she was a leader in the effort to ratify the 19th Amendment after it had passed Congress. She was a graduate of Radcliffe College, and she left her papers and memorabilia to the college, and that was really the start of the Schlesinger Library on the History of Women in America, which is now at the Radcliffe Institute. Pauline Agassiz Shaw, she served as the president of BSAG for 10, 16 years. She was a wealthy philanthropist who supported many causes, including kindergartens, school lunches, the North Bennett Street School, a settlement house in the North End, and the Paul Revere Pottery, which was founded to provide a livelihood for immigrant Irish, Italian, and Jewish girls in the North End. Margaret Born, Margaret Foley was born in Boston. She earned the nickname the Grand Heckler for her powerful voice in the suffrage movement. She had worked as a hat factory as a young woman. She was unique in her links to both the Women's Trade Union League and the Margaret Brent Suffrage Guild, which was a Catholic organization. She was an active member of several organizations and she delivered countless impassioned speeches traveling by automobile from one destination to another in what she called her big suffragette machine. <laughs> On one occasion, she delivered suffrage material to the city of Lynn by tossing it out while riding in a hot air balloon. <laughs> Susan Walker Fitzgerald was active in the campaign for suffrage. She began her career in progressive causes while still in college at Bryn Mawr where she organized a student government association. She also served as executive secretary of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. And after 1920, she was the first female Democrat elected to the Massachusetts House of Representatives. Then we go to the Boston Public Library. Um, and in the Bates Hall reading room, we see a bust of both Lucy Stone and Alice Stone Blackwell. Alice Stone Blackwell was the daughter of Lucy Stone and Henry Blackwell. She was an activist for suffrage, human rights, and peace. She edited the Woman's Journal after her mother's death, and in 1890 led the movement to reconcile the two competing branches of the suffrage movement. She was also involved in many humanitarian causes, including relief for Armenian refugees, labor reform, and rights for African Americans. We in the Boston Women's Heritage Trail, and I hope all of you feel that Lucy Stone is a real hero. She's our New England suffrage woman. And um, she was also a national leader, but we feel she's sometimes overlooked. There are four pieces of public art in Boston which honor her, though. One in Faneuil Hall, one in the State House, one in the Boston Public Library, and one at the Boston Women's Memorial. There are any part of her speeches or talks available? I think there are quotes. Actually, there is one fairly lengthy speech called Disappointment is a Lot of Women that's available online. Um, 
And I don't think there are a lot of other, there's a fair number of her codes. I'm not, but I'm not a teacher, so uh, that's the local connection to this. Right. This area. Right, exactly. And you can uh, Google, I think you Google Lucy Stone's speeches, that one will come up, but it's called Disappointment is a Lot of Women. It was a speech she gave at a women's suffrage convention. But one of the reasons that she's overlooked is that she was very modest and she preferred working behind the scenes. But the other reason is that she had a major falling out with Susan B. Anthony and, and, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton over whether to support the 15th Amendment, which gave black men the right to vote. If any of you have seen, um, there's a Ken Burns documentary on the Elizabeth um, Katie Stanton and Susan B. Anthony and explains that they had worked very hard for women's right to vote and then after the Civil War, the movement to give African American the men to vote, um, or you know, right to vote, um, came up and that was the 15th Amendment. And they were outraged that it didn't include women and in fact it was the first time that women were actually prohibited from voting because it included the word men. Um, Lucy Stone, however, decided that she would support that amendment. She had been a, worked really hard in the abolitionist circuit and she was a good friend of Fred, Frederick Douglass and so forth. So she supported the 15th amendment and said, we will give black men the right to vote and then it will be women's turn. But Katie Stanton and Susan B. Anthony wrote the history of the suffrage movement and uh, so they put their views in the history and they sort of left out. They didn't give Lucy Stone much attention in the history of the suffrage movement. So we feel that's one of the reasons that she's overlooked but uh, we like to keep talking about Lucy Stone and so should all of you because <laughs> it's pointed out she's a local person. So along with all this committee work, leafleting the bazaars and speeches and journalists, Suffragists also staged parades. This is a parade which took place in Boston in 1915, and then the next slide is one of their magnificent floats that was part of this parade. This parade was held because there was a referendum on the ballot in November of 1915 that was in Massachusetts that would have given the right to vote, right to, vote to women in Massachusetts. And the suffragists were pretty convinced it was going to win, so uh, they had a premature victory parade, but the referendum was voted down in November. So it took another five years before it happened at a national level. And I'm gonna end the presentation with an important event in uh, suffrage, Boston suffrage history. We talked before we started about President Wilson, and some of the suffragists were disappointed with President Wilson. He had originally been opposed to women's suffrage, but then he came around and he decided it was a good idea. But the people working for suffrage felt that he wasn't doing enough to encourage the Senate and the House of Representatives to pass the amendment. So they decided to um, put some pressure on him. And he was scheduled to visit Boston in, on February 23rd, 1919. He was on his way home to the United States from the Paris Peace Conference, which happened at the end of um, World War I. And the city of Boston decided to land and a ship in Boston, and the city of Boston decided to hold a huge parade for him. They closed a lot of the stores, thousands of people were lining the streets. The women decided this was a good time to make a statement. There was a reviewing stand set up at the State House, and they decided to picket the reviewing stand. So when they did that, they went to the um, line up in front of the reviewing stand. The police came by and said, you have to move. And they said, we are not going to move. And the police arrested 19 women for loitering without a permit. I mean, there, there were thousands of people standing in the streets of Boston. And these women were arrested for loitering for more than seven minutes. One of the women that was arrested was Betty Graham Swing. She was a woman who had a experience in this because she had previously been arrested in Washington, D.C. Um, when she picketed the White House on November 10th, 1917. She, along with the other women that were arrested then, were taken to the Occoquan Workhouse, which is in Virginia. 
and they experienced something you may have heard about called the Occoquan Workhouse Night of Terror. Um, on November 14th, the prison warden there ordered the guards to terrorize the jailed suffragists. Most were beaten, some to unconsciousness. Betty Graham Swing joined the eight days hunger strike that followed in the workhouse. They were force fed raw eggs and milk. This incident made national news. Of the suffragists that were arrested protesting for um, the right to vote, only women were only actually jailed in two cities, in Washington, D.C. and in Boston, Massachusetts. According to newspaper accounts, Betty Graham was only the only person arrested in Boston who resisted arrest. Um, I must say that the women in Boston were not treated badly the way that they were treated in uh, Washington, D.C. The other thing that happened on that same day in Washington was the staged watch fires on uh, Boston Common at the Parkman Bandstand. Watch fires were something that had been started in Washington, D.C. when um, suffragists would burn copies of President Wilson's speeches outside the White House. It was another way they thought to put pressure on him. So in the afternoon of the demonstration in front of the White House, women burned, actually they burned blind copies of paper because they didn't have copies of his speech yet. But it was, it was, um, that's what they were trying to burn. And three women were arrested then and taken to jail to join those who had been arrested in the morning. The women were taken to the Women's Detention Center, which is in the basement of the Pemberton Square Courthouse. And they were held there overnight and then taken to court the next morning. The 19 suffragists arrested were charged with loitering, I said that before, or speaking in the common without a permit. One very young woman had her case continued and later dismissed, and one was acquitted. The rest were convicted and given the choice of paying a $5 fine or spending eight days in jail. Four women paid the fine, but the remaining 13 refused and were taken to Charles Street Jail to serve their sentences. And this is a copy of the jail, which is now in Boston, the Liberty Hotel. So finally, after all this work, after the parades and protests, the arrests, the journals, the leafleting, the soapbox speeches, the bazaars, the campaigns, the lecturing, countless meetings, the conventions, the demonstrations, the petitions, the lobbying, suffrage won. March forward. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed the, oh, my big dramatic ending, and I missed the prison special. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> you. To publicize the um, suffrage's arrest, the National Women's Party organized what was called a prison special. This is a chartered train tour. They uh, started in February 1919 from Washington, D.C. and traveled throughout much of the United States. 26 suffragists aboard the train had all been imprisoned for picketing. At each stop, they spoke to large crowds about their prison experiences, usually in prison garb. And then they came to Boston on March 9th through 10th, appearing at the Wilbur Theater and they were joined by the suffragists who had been jailed in Boston. So then we go to March Forward. Suffrage one, March Forward. However, it is important to, for all of us to acknowledge that even though women got the right to vote in 1920, you know, the issue of who can vote is still with us today and it was with us for a long time after that. The last 12 states to ratify the amendment did so over many years. Some later in the 1920s, some throughout the 1940s, 1950s, and 60s. The last five to ratify the amendment were Georgia and Louisiana in 1970, North Carolina in 1971, South Carolina in 1973, and Mississippi in 1984. Native Americans were not recognized as citizens until 1924 and were still not allowed to vote. Asian Americans did not become citizens until 1924 um, and win the right to vote until 1952. Many people of color, we know, were prevented from voting. So Congress passed the Voting Act 
Voting Rights Act in 1965, but that act was weakened in, in 2013. So we know that there are still issues today about who can vote and how easy it is for people to vote. We saw just last week people standing in line in Austin, Texas for six or eight hours to vote. So it's something that we all need to realize that voting issues are still an important issue today. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. I just wanted to yep. say um, thank you, Catherine. <laughs> really fascinating. So good. Um, this program was brought to us by the Friends of the Library. And if it wasn't for the generosity of friends, we wouldn't have been able to have this. So I'm glad you all came out tonight. And I'm sure there's probably some questions or comments. So I'll get out of the way. <laughs> I uh, was very moved when I visited Susan B. Anthony's birthplace. Uh -huh. uh, Lucy Stones is not like a big thing, but the. Uh, she's recognized there. She's yep. recognized mm -hmm. in West Brookfield, and mm -hmm. they bestow an award every year. Mm -hmm. uh, more men need to recognize the importance of, of this. I spend a lot of time with my students on this. Uh, we go through the Declaration of Rights and Sentiments as opposed to the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, especially Susan B. Anthony's uh, being willing to get arrested for right, right, right. which I think is a critical story which is not told about. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. Um, well, and I think it's also important, as you say that, it's important for us to recognize, too, I know I emphasize women, but there were also many men that were active in the suffrage movement, too. So it certainly was, uh, as I said, there was a men's association for suffrage, and there were other men that were active, too. So. Is there any sort of central mass or trail or, or a more statewide notation of these key Location. There is an effort right now by in the Mass Legislature, and I, I, I don't remember who's behind it, but there are two women legislatures that are trying to push a statewide trail, or a statewide, I guess they're calling it a trail, of important um, sites throughout the state, because obviously there are, I mean, Massachusetts can be very proud because both Susan B. Anthony and Lucy Stone were born here. Um, Sojourner Truth, as you know, spent a lot of time in Florence, Massachusetts. Oh, and we've had a woman governor, which we've never managed to have a woman president, but we have. And uh, so I, uh, there is a need, but there is a movement to, uh, to try to do something statewide, yes. So is that tour something you could walk like in an afternoon? The, the trail the, there? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. This was definitely deliberately kept as a walking tour. So mm -hmm. yes, you could walk it in an afternoon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And most of our trails are trails that you can walk. And it's a self-guided walk. It's a self-guided walk. It's on our website. Uh, we are trying to, I think somebody said they had, um, Denise, did you say you had seen it online? The yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, and I have have brochures out here. Right, you can take the brochure. Um, I was going to say we're trying to get it online, but maybe it's already online. But our other seven tours are online too. So bwht.org is the um, website and it's on the brochure. Now, Seneca Falls gets all the attention. I've, I've seen the reference to the fact that the Worcester Convention was held, but I haven't seen any great providing of information or resources on what actually happened there. Well, Worcester was really important because, as I said, there were much, many more people in Worcester, and that was sort of, and then after that, they annually had national conventions. So uh, Seneca Falls was sort of the beginning, but Worcester was a really, the first really organized. So where would one go to? Because again, I want to make, have my students make right. the local connection. I might interject just because right. I used to work at the Worcester Historical Museum. So oh. if you go to the library there, I believe they may have some information. Um, you know, they shift their exhibits around, so they may, may have something. Um, but I think if you go talk to the library, Start. Right, and I know there is a, a Worcester historical or Worcester 
Women's History Association. I don't know how active they are, but somebody mentioned the, the celebration they had honoring the um, anniversary a couple of years ago, or quite a few years ago, and they were very active at that time, and they may still be active. But Abby Foster, um, help me. Yeah, uh, Abby Kelly Foster, her, right? Yeah. <laughs> right, was a very Someone important. Plays her Right, so there is a woman who does yeah, a one-woman show. Yeah, yeah. She, she goes to the historical museum quite often. Yeah, actually. yeah, yeah. So she was a very important figure. We don't mention her because we're very Boston-centric. <laughs> <laughs> well, she does have a school named after. Yeah, good, yeah. good, <laughs> good. Yep. Will you please repeat the fallen date when women got the right to vote? Well, it was not the right to vote because the, the, the amendment was passed in 1920. It was just a matter of only 36 states had to ratify the amendment to make it part of the Constitution. So after that, all women in the country had the right to vote. Not that they all could vote, but they all had the right to vote. But then other states that hadn't ratified it earlier later ratified it. I mean, it's like... Who is it? Virginia just ratified the Equal Rights Amendment. Mm -hmm. um, but it was 1984 for Mississippi. I mean, it was meaningless at that time because it was already in effect since 1920, part of the Constitution. But it took that long for them to officially recognize it. And the British sisters, were they from the South? Yes, they were from South Carolina, right. They both grew up in South Carolina in a slave-owning family. And uh, Angelina left first and uh, went to Philadelphia and became a Quaker. And then Angelina, or uh, Sarah, maybe I got that wrong. Maybe Sarah went first. Sarah was the older of the two. But they really became known as speakers on the abolitionist uh, circuit, as it was called. Yeah, there's a great, is that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a fair amount of written about them, and they were very influential in the abolitionist movement because a lot of the abolitionists were from the North, but the Grimke sisters had real experience. They grew up with slaves, and so they had real experience with what it meant to uh, live with slaves. Some really interesting things written about them here. And Angelina Mary Theodore Weld was also well known in the abolitionist circuit. This was great. Thank you. Well, you're quite welcome. Thank you all for coming. It's great that you came.